From the water, Lytoler saw the ship coming apart. But his harrowing account does not explain Titanic's mangled condition today. from Titanic with more questions than answers. One of the surprising things was the way in which the vessel had broken up. There doesn't appear to be a pattern. Uh, one panel of steel is bent one way. This neighboring panel is bent another way. And no one simple explanation can explain just all the forces that were happening to the ship. While Livingstone grapples with the puzzle of how Titanic tore to pieces, Bill Garski's colleagues in the United States may be on the verge of some answers. Piece by piece, a virtual Titanic is being built. Okay, so when you're building a finite element model, if you start off bulkhead... By the computer model is based on key information from the expedition, as well as some of the ship's design plans. So what we have here is the Titanic and, or the beginning of the the finite element model of the Titanic. This modern engineering tool can begin to reveal the escalating forces that acted on Titanic's hull. Next we've added a deck and lastly there's the boat deck. For the very first time researchers can begin to calculate the forces that impacted Titanic before she broke. The stresses within the ship are shown with a spectrum of colors. Red represents the most severe. The team first looks at the stresses within Titanic on calm seas. I don't see very many stresses in that. But as the wounded ship fills with water, the stresses in the midsection increase dramatically. Wow, what is that? This is the ship uh, just prior to breakup. It's taken on a lot of water in the bow, and that rapid change causes the stresses to increase. So basically our ship is bending. The forward end of the ship is, is flooded. The, the top part of the ship is pulling apart in tension. The, the, the bottom or the keel of the ship is compressing and the steel plates in the keel are actually buckling. As the bow pulls down, the huge stern rises in the air. The equivalent of a 25-story building suddenly looming above the water. The stresses that we have in the deck are on the order of 35,000 pounds per square inch. And that's about 50% higher than what the Titanic was actually designed for. The myriad of stresses within Titanic were so enormous that they overwhelmed the ship.
perhaps most revealing, the model helps to support eyewitness testimony that Titanic broke apart on the surface. I heard explosions, a sort of rumbling sound. I imagined the decks had blown up with the pressure pulling the boat down. Major Arthur Pushan. You could see a propeller right clear. And you could see underneath the keel. You could see part of the keel. Joseph Scarrett. And her lights went dim as she broke clean in two. Steward. Frederick Crow. There was no sound for what seemed like hours. And then the cries for help would seem to go on forever. Emily Ryerson. The next clue in the great ship's demise is being pulled from the ocean bottom. Today, a piece of titanic steel is raised to the surface. As the historic relic rises over the nadir, a sense of awe and reverence is felt among the crew. Titanic steel has its own story to tell after nearly a century of burial at sea. The night of the disaster, many survivors claimed they heard incredible noises, awful and frightening sounds. In the case of Titanic, you're talking about thousands of square feet of plate that are being mutilated and torn and giving off a tremendous amount of noise. Is it possible that the noises heard that night were titanic steel plates shattering like glass? To answer this question, a key piece of evidence is headed for America. Reconstruct what may have happened, titanic steel has come here to be dissected and analyzed. Under the guidance of metallurgist Professor H. P. Laley, a team will test to see if titanic steel is especially brittle.
A small sample is cut and loaded into a scanning electron microscope. Metallurgist Chris Ramsey and Scott Miller peer deep into the steel's microstructure. Lots of inclusions, let's focus it real fast. And then go back down in magnification, see what we have. They are looking for potential weaknesses and defects in the steel. Higher magnification shot. Lots of ferrite and perlite, big inclusion. That's a big one, probably a big old manganese sulfide. That's a big one. As they suspected, the steel is full of large manganese sulfide inclusions, chemical imperfections that create weak areas which cause the steel to be brittle. Such was usually the case for steel produced in the early 20th century. Steels in that turn of the century were made in very small lots, maybe 70 tons, whereas today we make them 400 ton batches. Quality control was not, was a problem in those days. Certainly compared to today's steels, this is inferior, but for the steels at the time, it was probably about as good as they could do. We've got perlite. You wouldn't want to build a ship out of this stuff today. At the time the Titanic was built, no one suspected that these chemical impurities could make steel fragile under extreme conditions. Investigators suspect that the extreme cold water temperatures of the North Atlantic caused the steel to become even more brittle. The waters of April 14th to 15th, 1912 are unusually cold for the Atlantic at that time of year. 28 degrees seawater is not the ordinary seawater you find in April. H.P. Laley chills a bar of titanic steel to the water temperature the night of the disaster. The sample will be subjected to a violent impact. The fractured piece of Titanic is sent to another lab to be examined by mineral scientist Timothy Fakey. I find it quite exciting to be able to work on uh, steel from the Titanic, to be able to look at the mystery of what all went together to contribute to the sinking. Fakie's tests confirm that titanic steel with its weak manganese sulfide areas became more brittle when subjected to the cold temperatures. The fracture surface shows 95% um, of the grains in the sample cracked. The lines of the fracture trace back to the weak spots in almost every case. So you see the effect of manganese sulfide particles on the fracture behavior of this steel. More or less, when you take the steel down to a lower temperature, you're actually shattering something that's just full of holes. The night of the disaster, as Titanic begins to break, it's likely that much of the ship's steel suffered brittle fracture. This new evidence supports what some survivors heard. No 
Nobody knows for sure what happened to Titanic once she dipped beneath the waves and headed for the ocean floor. Researchers want to know how the bow escaped relatively unscathed. The stern, on the other hand, is completely destroyed. Decks are curled back. The hall is in shambles. What happened to the stern on her way down to the bottom? We don't have a real fine uh, understanding of what happened as the ship sank from the water surface down to the seabed because of the myriad of forces that are involved here. It's a, fa a fantastic contrast because the forward end actually looks like a ship. David Livingstone and Bill Garski are trying to reconstruct what happened to the bow and the stern once they slipped beneath the surface. It, it still looks very much like a, like, like, a, a ship. like a ship. The railings are there, fantastic shadows. They believe that as the bow dropped, it was already filled with water, so it was not crushed by the increasing water pressure. The bow actually is is in good condition compared to the stern because of the equalization of pressure during the sinking process of the surface. The model is not strictly correct. Livingstone believes that the wreck site holds clues to how the bow arrived in its final position. On the starboard side, there is this big wave, almost a bow wave of silt where the, the ship was pushing in. And there is, uh, uh, and the anchor is, uh, the bottom of the anchor is just about on the silt. I see. Another clue to the bow's impact is found on the port side. Over, over the top of the bridge and... To Livingstone's down, surprise, down there's a giant bend in the hull. At the big radius bend. The bend on the port side in the hull, um, it certainly took me by surprise. The condition uh, of the hull in that area where it had bent round, uh, right around 180 degrees in a radius of uh, perhaps about three meters. And the hull hadn't fractured. Uh, the, the plates were intact. What uh, uh, could have happened, Bill, was that the ship was sinking nose down. Nose down. But going sideways, sideways at the same time. and then buried itself in, into the silt. The back end, just with the momentum of the steel and all the entrained water in it, just wanted to keep going. Yes. And squashed up. Right, that sounds it, plausible. It, 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 it just actually concertinaed and, and made this big buckle. Yes. That is, I think, just about there. Understanding how the stern arrived on the bottom is a bit more puzzling. It was number four, which we had placed in you know, two days earlier. The stern wreckage is chaotic. This, too, is an important clue. Um, Livingstone and Garski think that after the bow pulls the stern underwater, the bow and stern separate. The incredible pressure on air trapped inside the stern causes inward implosions. To Livingstone's trained eyes, Titanic's propellers provide clues as to how the stern finally landed on the bottom. The propellers are curiously bent upwards, which suggests that the aft end of the stern hit the bottom first. And it would almost look as if the aft end hit the bottom, uh, just dropping like a stone. Hit the bottom, which is very hard mud, and then would have stopped in a rather short time. And that would cause classic shock damage. Anything that was not well attached would break loose.
It took some 15,000 people two years to build Titanic. She was made with more than 25,000 tons of steel. And her engines produced nearly 50,000 horsepower. But the forces of nature simply tore the greatest ship of her day to pieces in a matter of minutes and spread them out across the ocean floor. Surprisingly, the scattered pieces are not fully mapped. Their final location will now be recorded for history. Over the past several days, the crew of Nadir has been busy modifying Natil. The submersible is outfitted with another of Paul Mathias's sonar devices. Mathias will attempt a first. Using new software technology, he will try to create the first archaeological map of the entire wreck site which is almost one square mile. Well, the Titanic is a huge ship. It's bigger than anything we've ever imaged. It's one giant uh, behemoth on the ocean floor. There has never been a routine, detailed survey of the Titanic. Preparation for this investigation began half a world away in the warm, shallow waters off the coast of Greece. Matthias was here to fine-tune his imaging technology on Titanic's identical twin, Britannic, which sank two years after Titanic during World War I. Sonar image quality largely depends on how close the fish can get to the wreck. As the fish passes over the site, it sends out an acoustic signal. The signal rebounds off the ship, and the software creates an image. In a matter of hours, Britannic is revealed lying on her side on the ocean bottom. Next, Matthias validates what he saw in his ghostly images with an eyewitness inspection of Britannic. By fine-tuning his software here in the shallow seas, he increases his chances of capturing an image of Titanic in extremely deep waters. Matthias confirms much of what his sonar imaged. The railings on the bow. The promenade deck. the great hole caused by her sinking during the First World War. And even her massive propeller. Matthias leaves Greece with high hopes for Titanic. Compared to the warm waters of the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic is deep and dangerous. The weather here is now turning for the worst. 
there's no guarantee that Matthias will succeed in this inhospitable environment. On his way to Titanic, Matthias prepares his imaging software. Thirty feet above the wreck, the team begins scanning the area in a process called mowing the lawn. What we're doing now is we're scanning across the seabed in the nautile with a sonar looking out to 600 feet on either side, and we're building up a picture of the seabed. A routine survey has never been done in the area. This is the first tape of uh, side scan data over the Titanic taken by a submarine. We've also collected the data on uh, optical disk on the computer. That one's at 2347. Matthias and Derzenko now begin to plot out the first archaeological map of the Titanic wreck site. Wow, look at that. Look at that. That's the bow. For the first time, the entire bow can be seen on the ocean floor. That's a nice image. That's a really nice image. The stern is also revealed. The broken end of the stern is right here. Yeah, look at that. Looks like it's bent right here. The sonar mapping has even turned up a surprise. That is a big piece of the hull right there. When Titanic broke in half, she was severed in two places, creating a third piece, most of which disintegrated. Now recorded on videotape and plotted on the map, some 60 feet of her hull has been discovered intact. Researchers believe the other half of Titanic's massive engine is under this piece. Further explorations of the site may provide the answer. Hey, Steve, uh, got the tip of the bow at 5717. Gradually, a map of the whole wreck site emerges as they first position the bow and stern. Five, seven. Okay. Okay, the propeller end of the stern is 5170. The sonar data has also outlined two other important areas. We're also getting debris pattern. Within these circles lay most of the artifacts from the Titanic disaster. Scattered across the ocean bottom are objects that poured from Titanic as she sank. Each defines the ship's character and tells another part of her story. Many of Titanic's treasures find their way to the French countryside where they are restored. A protective coat of polish is applied to one of the ship's whistles, last heard at high noon on the very day Titanic struck the iceberg. This was Titanic's voice. This is what made her speak. 
the whistles. And there they are. We have them. We know what they're like. It's one thing reading about them, but to see them gives you an entirely different impression of what they were. Stefan Pennick belongs to a group of conservation artisans, each with their own unique specialty. As a trained archaeologist, Pennick carefully supervises the preservation of Titanic's artifacts. Master woodworker Terry Polanc meticulously reconstructs the wooden base of one of the ship's compasses. Each retrieved object becomes an integral part of a new and historical record. A thing a human couldn't leave without having a um, their own roots and culture. It's probably the main difference between animals and, and human people. The artisans take a minimalist approach to conservation. For them, the objects are more meaningful if they keep a trace of the trauma they suffered. a ceramic figurine. Seawater can pull a glossy surface away from its base. Chemical treatments and air drying will stabilize the cracking. In the hands of Marielle Bouchara, a simple souvenir from Holland is transformed into an object of poignant beauty. Intricate metal lattice work that adorn titanic deck benches now soak in tubs of chemicals. Pennick monitors the bath for chloride, a leading cause of corrosion in metals. Each object reacts differently when exposed to the sea. Pennick calls on an eclectic background to save the titanic artifacts. So in terms of training, you have to be able to understand chemics, physics, degradation processes. You have to be able to understand in terms of history, art, What's the meaning of the object? You can't restore a, a clock or a, or a car if, if you don't know a bit of, of the techniques involved in it. Isabel Celia Colso puts the tiny components back into a clock. A clock that froze in time on April 15, 1912. Remarkably, a man's suitcase was recovered from the ocean's floor. Martine Plantec carefully unfolds the garments.
Dirt and oxides are washed away from the pants, gloves, and shirts that were so neatly folded and packed for a trip to America so long ago. The unpacking action is one of the strongest feeling of, of the conservation process. Because that's the time where you do the, what should have been when you arrive from, from a trip, you unpack your, your stuff. And uh, in fact, we, we just switch. It's, it's, the, the guy can't unpack now. And we have the next one. It's very strong in terms of emotion. Of all Titanic objects being preserved here in France, perhaps the most incredible ones are made of paper. I think it's unbelievable. If you, if, if you had to bet about that, no, no one will bet about having paper being able to be, to be recorded. Living treasures of music sheets, banknotes, letters and diaries survived because they were stuffed away inside leather bags, protected from the elements. Today, these personal writings remind us of lives lost. Roy sends best wishes. Wishes he was traveling like you. I wish you prosperity wherever you go. Hello, Roy. Your sincerely. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hope to hear from you in the new year. I am just living so from day to day for the time when you will be back. I could not be untrue, even if I wanted to. When we put the picture together, when we look at the objects that these people had in their final moments, it gives us, I think, a greater understanding of just exactly who they were. And by knowing the characters in the drama, you get a much better insight into the, the great drama of that night. In all, some 5,000 Titanic artifacts have been recovered. Many can now be seen in exhibits throughout the world. Each reaches out in an intimate human way to keep the memory of Titanic alive. The Titanic herself can be considered the ultimate artifact. But the ship can never be raised, never preserved. And unlike the artifacts conserved in France, Titanic is disappearing rapidly with no practical chance at restoration. At the Titanic site, Roy Colomar is retrieving his rustical traps. There may be clues to Titanic's ultimate fate inside these tiny vials. And maybe we're approaching the time when the Titanic is going to become very fragile. And uh, we need to know how fragile she is becoming. The rustical structures are extremely delicate, and they are collected gingerly. One day, Titanic II may crumble away.
Back in his lab, Colomar is quick to get to work. Etchings in a strip of 35 millimeter film show signs of bacteria. These trails were created as the bacteria ate the gelatin in the film. For Colomar, these colorful etchings are a sign of vigorous life at the Titanic site. Colomar discovers many different kinds of bacteria. The solutions in the red cap tubes show discoloration, proving the existence of iron-eating bacteria. Colomar confirms that iron bacteria are devouring Titanic. It's a, a complicated uh, living system, and it's not just one species. We've already isolated a number of community structures of bacteria from there. Inside the hard shell of the rusticle, Colomar has found bacteria, fungi, and other molds. He injects nutrients into a rusticle to keep it alive. He hopes to discover how they create their unique outer shell. The anatomy of the rusticle is complicated. These life forms embody a web of water channels, ducts, and cavities. The amount of surface area packed into the rusticles is astonishing. The science of the rusticles is fascinating from the point of view that the rusticle has such a huge surface area. If I took 650 tons of rusticles on the bow of the Titanic, spread the surface area, it would cover 23,000 square miles of surface area. So essentially we're seeing that there's a complex community. We don't understand all of the components. This is a new part of science that we're only just beginning to explore, the edge of yet another universe. Colomar extracts some of Titanic's iron each time he dries out a sample of rusticle. Judging from the amount of iron collected, he believes that as much as 20% of the bow has been consumed by the organisms. And from the philosophical point of view, what I see there is we're seeing the inevitability. Everything recycles, absolutely everything. Today, the story of Titanic is moving into her final chapter. The most luxurious ocean liner in the world is slowly disintegrating, transforming to dust and iron ore. By exploring Titanic before it's too late, the story of her tragedy is kept alive. In the light of morning, the survivors of the Titanic disaster found themselves adrift in the cold North Atlantic. Seven hundred and five people had survived the cold and dark in lifeboats. Twenty-eight men stood until they were rescued on this upside-down boat. 
often huddled together in prayer. The passenger ship Carpathia rescued many survivors that morning. While the rest of the world waited to hear what had happened, most survivors were silent, quiet, stunned. They would complete their voyage to New York, but nothing had turned out as planned. In Titanic's giant berth, her lifeboats were placed where the great ship should have been. A place of joyous arrival was instead a reminder of tragic loss. Tragically, a lot of people lost their lives on the Titanic. And I don't think we should dwell on the tragedies so much as learn from the tragedies so that it doesn't happen again. And the Titanic maintains an elegance as if she's saying to us, don't avoid me, but learn from me. Don't avoid tragedies, but learn from tragedies. Nearly a century ago, the Titanic disaster shocked the world. Even today, we still struggle to understand the events of that night. Science has given us a way to go back in time, to replace myth with fact, to develop new theories, and to reconstruct a defining moment of the 20th century. We've accomplished a lot on this operation. We've imaged the hull beneath the mud line and detected the damage caused by the iceberg. Perhaps a little better what the mystery of Titanic is all about. It's a question of uh, steel, question of naval architecture, exceeding the limits of what the ship was designed for. That's why she sank, exceeding the limits of what she was designed for. History is enriched by new discoveries. And the story of Titanic lives on with each new retelling of her tragic tale. Every expedition really contributes new information. But I think this one uh, really is, is contributing uh, solid, reliable information, not only in terms of the present condition, but by extension, what the ship's future condition will be, as well as what happened in the past. Titanic represented not so much the end of an era. Titanic represented the cause and the reflection that, well, maybe we're not so great as we thought we were. But I'll tell you what, it's not gonna happen again. The lessons of Titanic still resonate with meaning. Even to this day, the story of this great ship can still touch our hearts. And so I looked at the ship as she's looming up, and I thought, here is a gray lady, an elegant lady, a queen of the deep. A sad lady, a silent lady, are you now asleep? Can we learn from your sorrow to share? Teach us to understand and certainly to care that never again will there ever be a grey lady, an elegant lady, slip unwillingly into the sea.